Well, today I'd like to talk about autumn olive, friend or foe, okay? So this is a plant, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's called autumn olive because the fruit is ripe in the autumn, at least here in the north, and um, it's not related to olive at all. It's, uh, and it's only called autumn olive because the leaves look vaguely, vaguely like an olive tree, but the fruit you can see is a little red berry. Now this is, this is a plant that has, uh, the berries have uh, the best cancer-fighting properties of any food plant on earth, which is saying a lot. And yet, this plant is banned in a number of states, or at least certain counties in a number of states, in the, in, uh, the Midwest and Eastern Seaboard, uh, uh, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, and several other states, um, Tennessee. Uh, so why is it banned? Well, this plant um, has, uh, has the ability to spread under certain conditions, especially considering the history of this plant. Now, this plant is not native to the continental United States. It's native to Korea, Japan, China, the Himalayan region into Pakistan. So it has a wide range uh, of adaptability. It's very hardy and, uh, and apparently uh, even though it was introduced into the United States in the 1830s, it didn't really uh, take off until the 20th century when um, it was recognized for its remarkable ability to grow on really crappy soils. Uh, specifically um, the government recognized um, that, uh, that this plant, this shrub, would grow on mine tailings and other super disturbed infertile soils as a result of mining operations where there's uh, vast hillsides uh, created by mining operations where nothing would grow. And then you get torrential rains and what happens to those mine tailings? It gets washed down because nothing's growing on it into the waterways, polluting the waterways, affecting the fish population, affecting water quality, um, and uh, causing siltations of rivers and transport difficulties as a result. It became a really huge problem by the, uh, in, in, especially in, in mining uh, regions of the United States, such that uh, during the Great Depression, the government tasked hundreds of thousands of people with planting this plant. By the millions, they planted autumn olives, uh, shrubs, on uh, mine tailings and other super disturbed sites where nothing else would grow because these plants take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the ground through a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria, Frankia, that lives on the roots of these plants, much like alder trees and uh, other nitrogen-fixing plants, uh, peas and beans. And so, uh, so this plant has a remarkable ability to heal soil, to improve soils, so that other plants can start growing on those same soils. Uh, and when the leaves rain down in the fall, uh, it's like nitrogen pellets uh, and, and building organic matter on the soil. So, it, it, uh, so the, the government was mandating the planting of these shrubs uh, on a super massive scale. So naturally, when you have a plant that's, that's planted on a gigantic massive scale with, um, with red edible berries, birds are going to eat them. And then they're going to you know, fly around and poop them out, poop out the, the fruit, the seeds rather, and they're going to sprout. And so not surprisingly, this plant has naturalized. It is naturalized in many areas, and so people have come to think of it as invasive in those areas because it spreads so readily. Uh, and it's spreading on disturbed sites, uh, uh, be they um, uh, old mine tailings or eroded hillsides or even in pastures. Uh, you know, any place that, where the soil is disturbed or worn out from overgrazing, then, uh, then these plants are going to want to predominate. Uh, because of their extreme adaptability. So not only are these plants hardy to like zone three or four, but uh, to very cold areas, they can also take very hot areas. They can also take extreme drought. And uh, 
and and in this particular case we planted them here we planted this plant about 38 years ago when I cleared this ground and planted a walnut orchard here so we have walnut trees on either side and um, and I planted this um, I, the, I, I got the idea of growing these between my walnut orchard from a photograph I saw in, the, um, in a book called uh, Handbook of North American Nut Trees, published by the Northern Nut Growers Association. And so uh, this book um, uh, had, a, had an uh, a photograph of a, of a black walnut plantation interplanted with autumn olives with the idea that the autumn olives with the excess nitrogen fixation that they're, that they're doing um, would help the walnut trees to grow, which uh, walnut trees prefer rich, fertile soils uh, with a good supply of nitrogen in the soil. So it's a symbiotic relationship that could actually help the walnut trees to grow better. And uh, so I thought that was a really neat idea. And so without giving any thought to the edibility of these berries, I, planted, I interplanted these autumn olive shrubs in between my walnut orchard. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, they have proven to be uh, quite shade tolerant uh, and, uh, and also very drought tolerant. Now, uh, so this, this, uh, this bush is an illustration of how large they can get if you give them 40 years or so, 38 years, something like that. Uh, this is... Uh, um, and, and when I densely planted autumn olives in here, um, I, I eventually took most of them out because at the time I wasn't appreciating the value of the fruit. And uh, over time, as they spread as much as they did, I found that it made it harvesting a little difficult, uh, getting in to harvest the walnuts as they fell to the ground when it was uh, densely covered with autumn olive shrubs. I wound up taking most of them out. and. Uh, and of, uh, I, my interest in the, in the, in the plants, uh, just because it, they kind of got in the way of mowing and keeping the blackberries and such from just taking over in here and thistles and such. So we needed to be able to mow it, so we removed a lot of the autumn olive plants at that time. Uh, subsequently, um, about 20 years ago, I ran across an article that talked about the amazing qualities of the fruit, specifically incredible anti-cancer properties in these berries. Now these berries um, have uh, a lot of the the usual suspects in fruits you know like uh, uh, like vitamin C and and uh, and, and lots of uh, uh, beneficial nutrients but what's really uniquely remarkable about this fruit is the fact that it has the uh, the highest level of lycopene of any fruit. Now lycopene is uh, uh, something that's uh, most commonly appreciated in tomatoes. So when we think of uh, of uh, the health benefits of tomatoes, that's that's one of the the big ones. Is their very high levels of lycopene. Lycopene is uh, is something that actually has the ability to fight re free radicals in the body that can lead to cancers. So um, so tomatoes are very highly regarded in that in that regard. Now, um, for their very high lycopene content. Now, these berries have 17 times the lycopene level of tomatoes. So, it makes them just off the charts more beneficial in terms of suppressing the growth of free radicals in the body that can lead to cancers. So, um, so that uh, kind of got me uh, re-examining the potential for uh, growing this as a fruit. And interestingly, um, the lycopene is something that, while readily available in the fresh fruits of tomatoes or autumn olives, uh, it's much more available to the human body in a cooked form. So um, it's great to eat uh, tomatoes, you know, in our salads and things like that, but it's also good to cook tomatoes. Like I put them in the soup pot and such, so, so, that, um, so that more of the beneficial, beneficial lycopenes are, are available. Uh, and. Uh, so in the case of the autumn olive berries, what we're doing is uh, we're making them into jams. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a good tasting berry. Now one of the interesting things about uh, autumn olive berries is that, now here it is uh, mid-October, and uh, we're going to harvest these. Uh, the birds have already done their work here. 
uh, because this was an unnetted bush, because we let it get too big, um, they've already stripped most of the fruit. Uh, you know, we've had huge flocks of birds come in here, uh, you know, 500 or 1,000 at a time, and they've, they just went to work on this bush, and they just left a few patches down lower here, um, but they stripped most of it off. Um, but uh, uh, it's, a, um, it's a fruit that turns red, there are colors, uh, some varieties uh, turn uh, amber, <laughs> but, uh, which we'll look at shortly. Uh, but they turn color before they get sweet. So just because it's bright red, don't, don't assume that it's uh, ready to harvest. I mean, it certainly could be harvested at that time if you like your fruit real tart. But if you let it hang on for a few weeks, um, then they get a lot sweeter. And uh, so, um, and and so, like I say, this is just a seedling, and so the fruit is kind of small, even though it's, it was a productive plant. Um, we'll look at uh, several cultivars. Um, since we've started growing them as a commercial fruit, we've uh, looked at uh, selections from other places where they've selected them for larger fruit size and, uh, and sweeter fruit uh, and, and heavier yielding. And uh, it's been... Uh, projected that uh, a commercial planting of these, of, of good uh, cultivars, uh, could yield between uh, uh, two and six tons to the acre. Uh, so uh, a substantial yield. This is a, this is a commercial variety uh, called Ruby, and uh, you can see it's quite productive. Um, and uh, we covered this uh, with bird netting until a short while ago. Um, you can eat the whole fruit. There are seeds inside. The seeds, uh, you can just chew them and swallow them. The seeds themselves contain, they're a good source of fiber and also beneficial fats and proteins. So you don't normally associate with a lot of fruits with fats and proteins, but autumn olives have both. They have both, um, the, the fats are available in the flesh of the fruit itself as well as in the seed. So, um, you can um, you can you can spit the the seed uh, uh, out or just swallow it as a good source of fiber and extra fats and proteins. Um, but uh, they're very easy to harvest. Uh, you can just uh, you can just grab a whole bunch with a swoop of your hand, or you can actually spread um, a clean sheet underneath and hit them with a plastic bat and. Uh, if they're really ripe, they'll just fall right off onto the sheet. And um, so this is a this is a red variety, obviously uh, called Ruby. Not surprisingly, uh, this is a variety called Garnet, which we did not net, and consequently got stripped of birds and uh, a little more vigorous. Um, and certainly, these autumn olives can be kept to a size like this, which is much more practical for harvesting. Ruby here is probably a more compact variety naturally. Um, uh, this, uh, this shrub is only three years old, by the way, uh, growing in the shade of a walnut orchard. Now, it's interesting that, uh, that this, um, uh, this plant has, um, it's now mid-October, and um, um, we, had, um, we had no rain, we had no rain here from July 6th until September 14th or something like that. We had no rain for that whole summer period. No rain at all. And uh, received no irrigation. Growing in the shade of a walnut orchard and it's still able to produce this. So this crop. So they are very tough plants and uh, just remarkably well adapted. And over here we have uh, another selection of autumn olive. This is a variety called amber, uh, for obvious reasons. A different color, very productive. It's a little sweeter than uh, than than the ruby. Uh, and um, these appear to be generally self fruitful. So since we're on the subject of uh, of invasive species, I wanted to recommend two books on the subject. Uh, one is uh, Invasive Invasion Biology, Critique of a Pseudoscience by David Theodoropoulos, and the other is 
beyond the war on invasive species, a permaculture approach to ecosystem restoration by Tao Orion. Both excellent books I would highly recommend.